Hello, everybody, and welcome to our 10th edition of the Future Food Series. ProVeg Incubator and Sindanes, I welcome you to, the, to, today, to our today's session about the topic of molecular farming. Thanks, Fabio. It's a pleasure having you all here, our fantastic panel of startup founders on this very exciting topic of molecular farming, and also co-hosting this again with you the 10th time, as Fabio just said, is amazing. We started this just before the pandemic hit. So this was in this very room where we had an on-site event at the time. Then there was a, yeah, as you know, a harsh lockdown and it took quite a while. We established a an online a webinar version as most people had to do it at the time of this. And we are thinking of doing hybrid versions again in the future, inviting people to Berlin. But for now, this is the way we do it. It's just the two of us yeah. <laughs> and all of you out there. So in thanks much. For location here. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah. We spoke in, our, in the past uh, sessions about the topic of mycelium, about precision fermentation. We talked about the whole topic of where we are at the moment in the transformation in the alternative protein space. And as we said, the topic of today's session is molecular farming, the newest topic that everyone is, is talking about. And as uh, Albrecht mentioned, we have really four amazing speakers or more five amazing speakers here with us today. And we shall start with a short introduction. If you want to talk about this uh, topic today about uh, in, in social media channels, then please use the hashtag future food um, series. And uh, we are looking forward to hear a lot of questions. This will be a very, very interactive session. Um, and yeah, we are looking forward to today. So Thanks let's so kick much. it off. Yes. We want to start with an introductory round by our um, startup founders, of course. Everybody has a chance to talk about their work, about their vision, about their progress, challenges, problems, you may call it as you like. There are lots of them, of course, as well, but there's lots of excitement um, and we want to hear about that as well. We're going to start with uh, Laura Margarita Lopez Castillo or just Maggie to make it a bit easier, CTO and scientific co-founder at Veloz Bio, based in Mexico. And yeah, Maggie, you're the first one. And I would love to hear more about Veloz Bio, about your background, your journey, and where you are at at the moment. Thank you, guys, and uh, very acknowledged by, for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me being here on behalf of Veloz Bio. Well, for us, it has been a very amazing journey that started some years ago with another company, which name is Genius Foods, that uh, co-founded uh, by Enrique and Flavio, my partners. Starting uh, thinking, how can we be a sustainable alternative for, food, uh, for the food chain? The motivation started just uh, on thinking on the discarded fruit and vegetables that normally are wasted. How can we give an added value and to to use these ingredients that are normally wasted. Um, and we, we started thinking on, on the creation of ingredients that would be nutritious, that could be used in, in the food chain. But uh, in, in, in that means, uh, we also wanted to, to give another value and start the, the working with the idea of how can we get uh, these products with a high nutritional value that could be interesting to, to go to the, to the food supply chain. And, and we talked about uh, this uh, trend of a molecular farming that is very interesting and on thinking, how can we use the potential of plants to, to deliver these, uh, these amazing products because plants are one of the most amazing uh, biofactories. And uh, we talked about uh, this trend of molecular farming and the alternative proteins market that is very, very interesting. Um, and we went through, through that. In my particular experiences as a research scientist, I started working in the academics, working mainly in proteins and how to express proteins, how to purify proteins. And when I met Enrique and Flavio and they told me about this amazing adventure, I, I said absolutely yes. It's a very amazing and very new adventure to go to, to the market with this uh, amazing technology that is molecular farming. So the, the motivation is how to deliver to the market uh, affordable products using sustainable alternatives and going just with this amazing technology that is molecular farming. At the moment, we're working on, uh, we're focused 
uh, on their proteins, such as casings. And we're in the scaling up process that is a, is a, a very beautiful and sometimes hard journey, but we are very happy to be here and, and to be kind of a, a pioneers in this, uh, this technology. Thank you so much, Maggie. Maybe one, if you can elaborate just a little bit on the food waste aspect that you mentioned, that's quite interesting. So how are you combining these two things, which have to do with your personal and your co-founders uh, journey as, as, as entrepreneurs? How do you combine this, these problems of alternative or like the, the challenges that we have, food waste and we need more sustainable ingredients? Yeah, that's very, that's a very good question because um, here in Mexico, we have a, a lot of uh, problems with the uh, with the uh, with the nutrition on how people get a good nutrition and with the producers sometimes because uh, the weather is uh, crazy you know the the climate change is uh, is a reality and not uh, many people can get a uh, good nutrition good ingredients and uh, in my personal motivation uh, my background is in biochemistry uh, actually I'm very interested on nutrition I have some some years working in the in the world of uh, food consultancy and, and trying to develop products from small entrepreneurs or industries that go to the market uh, with uh, affordable prices and actually uh, good nutritional quality. So when I met Enrique and Flavio, we, we made this uh, this click, this uh, this merge of ideas, um, thinking on, on sustainable alternatives to provide people with, uh, with affordable products and with good nutritional qualities. And uh, we talked about these uh, these products that are normally discarded that actually are not that product. They have a good nutritional quality, and they can go to the market in, in added value products. That's uh, our main motivation. And we talked about this alternative, and for us, it has been a very amazing trip. Perfect. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, one question: How is it? You're based in Mexico. Um, how is the food tech scene there? So, especially when it comes to the alternative protein space and regulations. Yeah, actually, actually, it's a, it's a very good question. Here in Mexico, we're very open because uh, the regulations are very similar to the U.S. ones. So, in this case, uh, we can use these alternative proteins as uh, alternatives uh, for added value uh, proteins and. With high nutritional value, but the, the the good thing here in Mexico is that we have the same regulations from the U.S. That this technology is not uh, considered as a as a GMO technology, and this is a very huge advantage is in this way. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Maggie. Coming from Mexico directly to South Africa, uh, we are very happy to have uh, Thomas and Inge here from Aspire Foods. Um, welcome to you both. Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more about your story and uh, about Aspire Foods. Uh, yeah, sure. thank you so much, Fabio and Albrecht, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to chat on such an interesting panel. Um, so I'll start with my background. Um, I'm a molecular, bio the molecular biologist with several years of experience in biotechnology, um, specifically recombinant protein expression across several platforms, um, including whole plants, plant cell culture, mammalian tissue culture, and bacterial cell culture. Um, my research has mostly been in vaccine development and the development of diagnostic assays. So to be in the food space now is very exciting. Um, I've long been interested in technology-based long-term solutions to the environmental issues that are facing us globally. Cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as Inga said, thank you guys for having us. Um, I'm Thomas, I'm the CEO of Spy Foods, and uh, yeah, my background's a little bit more unconventional. Um, I grew up on a family-owned dairy farm, so come from the dairy roots in a sense, um, but I went eventually went to go study physics and engineering, um, and it was an interesting journey into the area of systems thinking, and uh, that's always been sort of a passion for me. Um, I came back to Cape Town, uh, so I studied in the US when I did my undergraduate and my master's, um, came back to Cape Town in 2018 during the drought um, that Cape Town had, which was something that sort of sparked a, 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 an interest in a wider variety of topics in, related to climate change. Um, and it's during that time that I got introduced uh, to the old protein scene more formally, coming from the physics and engineering background. Um, and 
yeah, having sort of these roots in the dairy space um, was a big motivator for me from an ethical perspective. I had questions even when I was a kid on that front. Um, and then the environmental um, aspect added to it, as Inga mentioned, is a big driver for us. Um, in terms of what we do at Aspire Foods, obviously, um, we're a molecular farming company. We're focused on creating affordable and indistinguishable cheese. So also focused on the casein side of things. Um, and we're doing this by utilizing field crops, um, specifically um, looking at uh, field crops with existing revenue streams. So thereby leveraging those existing revenue streams to create affordability. Um, and the, the foundational thinking around this is, you know, there's a lot of plant-based solutions out there, but in order to really get mass market adoption and mass market shifts, um, you really need to create something that's indistinguishable. And unfortunately, plants don't really have the capability as of yet. We may still be proven wrong, uh, but that's sort of what drove us in the direction of molecular farming. Um, and yeah, we're super excited to be here and excited to take on this this journey with you guys. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Can you tell us a bit more about the process? If you say, okay, your your process is based on existing revenue streams, and how do you extract then um, the the proteins from 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 this biomass uh, stream that's already existing? Maybe that we can go one step deeper. <laughs> sure. Um, so one of the, when we did the sort of deep dive evaluation into how to utilize molecular farming to solve this problem, uh, one of the key things that we looked at was methods to reduce the, the costs and the existing revenue streams for a lot of the crops that we are looking at um, are part of sort of the natural, the, the established food processing process, uh, which starts with oil, oil extraction. Um, usually from seeds or beans, and then it follows into either processing it to create a meal cake, which then gets sold as livestock feed, um, which, you know, that can always be repurposed. And that's sort of where we saw the value to be added. Um, there are some cases where those, uh, what's left over after the oil extraction is used as a, um, as, you know, transformed into proteins that are used for human food. Um, and that's something that we can also get on board with. We actually prefer that, obviously. Okay. And how is it about the the scene in general um, when you talk about biotech um, in the space of alternative proteins in South Africa? Is there a lot of openness? Is there a good community where you can have a lot of exchange? Are there? Can you can you give us some more insights about uh, where do you get your your sparring partners uh, from in in, in in South Africa? Sure. I think maybe Inge can speak about sort of the background of molecular farming in Cape Town specifically. It's quite extensive. Um, and then I'll speak about the general community a little bit. Yeah. So um, in Cape Town, we actually have a thriving molecular farming community. We have uh, um, a big unit at the university that does plant molecular farming specifically on the pharmaceutical side. And there's a new um, pharmaceutical startup as well. Another, a, a different one um, that has started up also in the pharmaceutical space with molecular farming. Um, in South Africa in general, there's a, like a pretty good acceptance of GMOs. Um, and I think the farmers are pretty open to it. So yeah, and yeah. in terms of the, the sort of ecosystem, generally speaking for biotechnology, there's a budding ecosystem, I would say. Um, there's quite a lot of startups spinning out of universities now. Um, we've got ourselves, we're um, one of our venture capital partners are, uh, I think they've got a portfolio of eight companies now, and they're not the only ones investing in the biotech space. So there's several other ones as well. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks so much. Let's continue this um, first round of, of, of introductions and questions with Gaston uh, Palladini, the CEO and co-founder of Mulex Science. You've been around for a little bit longer. I mean, this is a very nascent uh, industry and space still, but uh, you have, um, yeah, you have a history. So we would hear a little, like to hear a little more about that and about yourself and where it's going at the moment and how it's going for Mulek. Great, okay. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for uh, the invitation. I'm very glad to be here uh, with all of you. Um, I am also delighted to, to, to have a, 
uh, a specific panel for molecular farming, you know, and uh, it's sort of like a dream for me because well, well when I uh, uh, have started talking about molecular farming in alternative protein space, we were we were quite alone, you know. I I, I always knew that were uh, a lot of people working on that, but at that point in time, uh, everybody was, was talking about only precision fermentation, cultured meat, and um, the products on the marketing plant base. So I'm very glad that we are all together joining forces to uh, put molecular farming up the full technological pillar in alternative protein. Um, I'm pretty sure that we all agree about that. Uh, going back to my personal introduction, uh, very, very quick about myself. I'm not a scientist. I don't have a PhD. Um, um, I, I know a lot about food, uh, specifically about uh, uh, animal-based products, processing meat products. I'm part of the fourth generation of a traditional meat family business in Argentina. So one of the largest processed meat players in the region. Um, Big, big player. Well, 2023, we, we, we achieved a 100 year of history. So uh, quite big, uh, family owned. I spent more than 10 years on the board director of this family business. Uh, but I could say that I'm related to the, to the, to the um, traditional meat industry my whole life because of my, my, part, my, my father, my grandfather, and so on. Um, so um, I have a, a communication background, marketing, a business background, uh, some formal studies with MBAs and so on and so forth, but I, I'm sort of like a, a blend between innovation, uh, communication, and business, businesses. Um, of course, I'm, I feel like an entrepreneur and, uh, and it was quite natural for me to see the, the alternative protein landscape as, uh, as uh, the, the, the industry that I really wanted to, 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 to do my thing um, because of where I'm come from, of course, uh, and because I truly believe uh, because that I truly believe that we need to find alternative solution to fit the world. Uh, not because I'm vegan, not because I'm against the traditional industry, of course, because of where I come from, but because I truly believe that we need to boost the system from the inside, because it's quite impossible to substitute all day one. Right? And maybe we will never get that fully substitution. Maybe it doesn't make sense. You know? um, so that's why I founded Mulek. Um, I co-founded with Henko and Kamar Martin Salinas and together with BioSource Group. We didn't start from scratch. We are sort of like a spin out from an act and an, an act tech holding, biotech holding as well, that is BioCeres. Um, BioCeres supply science for sustainable agriculture, um, ending into new generation of seeds, focusing on climate change and sustainable sustainability approaches. Um, well, Mulek is a, a standalone compound by um, came in from, from BioCeres to apply. Uh, molecular farming technologies uh, uh, to food. I personally believe uh, that we are all proudly uh, a genetically uh, modifying um, team uh, and company. Uh, we embrace science in food and that's our um, uh, intrinsic motivation with a B2B model. Um, going now to, to Mulek, I'm glad to lead uh, a great team of, of PhDs all around the globe. We incorporated the company in the UK uh, with more than 20 patents in the spin out. Um, and we accelerate our R&D and pipeline uh, with teams uh, and people in the US. We all know that's a great place to, to find uh, molecular biologies, uh, plant biologies, et cetera. Uh, we also have a um, uh, staff um, and cultivation team in Argentina, makes sense for our um, for the multiplication of seeds, uh, for, for, for growers, and the network of bioservices quite large in the US and South America. So we keep these two territories uh, 
um, um, in, in our operations. And we also have a food tech team in the Netherlands, leading with Hank Hoog and Campbell. Uh, the Netherlands, well, you, we all know this is a great, great um, hub and place uh, with, with great food technologies. Um, so we work in, in, in between UK, US, uh, Argentina, and, and, and the Netherlands. Quite challenging to run a team with people around the globe, but uh, so far it's working uh, very well. Uh, now I'm, I'm traveling a lot because now we are not more anymore in any in, in lockdown, but it's working so far. Um, and just to, to summarize the, the company, we we use more course molecular farming techniques, uh, focusing on meat protein genes uh, in soybeans and pea. Of course, the blend is quite obvious. Obviously, uh, we, we, we think in the final application by combining meat protein genes with soy and pea, because soy is the main meat analog, meat extender. We are not thinking the, the host only as a host, also as a final product. We could always recover the protein, but we, we focus on affordable solutions. And if we put affordability on top of everything, we need to save uh, and cut uh, uh, intermediate cogs. That's why we believe in blends uh, by keeping the, the, the soy proteins, pea proteins together with the, with the meat protein genes to, to get um, better ingredients at the end of the, of the road. You know? Finally, we have the, our pipeline in two different stages, products uh, in a scale up stages. We, are, uh, we already have it approved it and patented in some territories. And, and we are more in the scale up stage, our safflower seeds, we get a, a, our proof of concept is a chymosine with safflower seeds. Um, and we have a GLA in safflower seeds as well. It's a gamma nilonenic acid from the oil part of the safflower. Makes sense for us to combine both and recover two products uh, from the same seed, from the same source, and, and, and improve the economics and the affordability of, of both projects. And finally, we have our meat protein genes with soy and pea. In, in R and D stages, in, in greenhouses, and moving forward, uh, learning from our sunflower platform in parallel. So, finally, and truly finally, here we are uh, recently public listed. We are. We, I'm happy to say that we are the first first movers in public markets. We are the first molecular farming food tech company in public markets by listed in Nasdaq. You could find molec as MLA ticker. MLA ticker in NASDAQ, so very, very happy to, to, to open now to and, and, and learn more for, for you guys, thanks. Thanks, thanks Gaston. Yeah, I mean, this was already a lot and there's more to, to, to touch on or like go, to go deeper into, into more detail of some of these things. One thing is it sounds more like a multinational, of course, you're a public company, which is very different from, 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 from um, most startups or from the other startups here. But at the same time, I think you are still at that stage and you have still that mindset and you're still far or quite far away from, from the market in a way, but we can discuss this further if, if you like in, in a bit. Now, yes, on yeah. to the time. Coming from uh, Argentina, UK or Netherlands to Israel, and I'm happy uh, to introduce Tal Lutsky, CEO of Pigmentum. Good to have you here. And yeah, tell us your story. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here and very excited to speak and to tell you about Pigmentum. Tal, now. So, I'm an agriculture. I, I grew many different crops in my life. Can you, can, can you hear me? Sorry, Tal, we have some connection issues. It was good before when we talked, but now yeah. there seems to be some issue with the, the, your, um, your uh, internet connection. Can you try again? Can you, can you hear me now? We can hear you, but you're not, you're frozen. Can you hear me? Frozen. Go ahead. Oh my God. Okay, so my, my background is mainly agricultural. I'm coming from uh, a kibbutz, uh, from a farm. I grew diff many different crops in my life and I worked uh, on a cow shed. Uh, then I went to study uh, agriculture in the Hebrew University. 
and uh, then we uh, establish Pigmentum together with, with two co-founders. I hope you're hearing me. Uh, I'm here, Professor Alexander Weinstein, uh, who is a leading expert in the field of molecular biology and uh, metabolic engineering, genetic engineering in plants. Uh, so our background is mainly metabolic engineering. Um, so we developed a platform, molecular platform, allowing us uh, turning mainly leafy plants into highly efficient producers of range of compounds. So we began with metabolites because our background is mainly metabolic engineering. So we produce pigments and aroma compounds such as vanillin and valencian and more many different compounds. We reach super ultra high concentrations. So this is our main focus to uh, uh, increase the, the concentration and the yields and the expression levels in the plants, which is one of the main challenges in molecular biology and, uh, and plants expression uh, in general. Uh, up to date, we produce eight different compounds with our uh, platform, both for life science and uh, food industry and today we are mainly focused uh, as the many others here on the dairy markets or alternative dairy markets in, in different uh, mainly functional uh, proteins two months ago we finalized the, our seed round of six million dollars and we are uh, moved to a new place and this is why maybe I, you're having problems to, uh, to hear me because the connection is <laughs> sometimes falling here. <laughs> uh, but this is on a nutshell. Yeah, but I think in, in general, it's, 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 it's working uh, quite well. How is uh, the, the topic of molecular farming seen in Israel compared to uh, precision fermentation and, and, uh, and, and cultivation? Because in general, if you... If you listen to, to the market and to the ecosystem, it's uh, there are a lot of very prominent companies coming from Israel. How is it seen there? The the the, the this topic and um, maybe you can give us some some idea here. And congratulations to raising six million, by the way. Thank you, thank <laughs> you very much. Um, uh, as you probably know, Israel is a. Uh, is a very uh, innovative place when it comes to uh, to many different things, but also in food tech. I believe Israel is the, is in the second place of uh, 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 fundraising uh, in the world after only second to the U.S. So it's uh, amazing. It's a very small country, and as you say. Most of the innovation is uh, in, in the food tech arena is around biotech uh, approaches. And uh, of course, precision fermentation and cell culture are the first. Uh, but molecular farming is coming more and more, uh, let's say, interesting in the market and common because uh, due to many different uh, reasons that we will probably uh, speak about it soon. Uh, but it exists mainly for life science and pharma uh, uh, ingredients uh, production for, I believe, 25 years at least in Israel. So it's, it's happening here. Um, but yes, food tech is uh, a lot about precision fermentation and, uh, and cell culture, I agree still. When we, we were, when we were talking about regulation, um, what would be your ideal uh, go-to market? Um, is it, is it, uh, would it then be in Israel or would it be in a different country because of regulation? And of course, also um, because of business partners, what, what would be the, the ideal way? So uh, the, go, the, go to, the ideal go-to market is not in Israel because in Israel is still a small country. So our first go-to market will probably be in a larger country and it will be in the US due to regulation processes. But in Israel, when we speak about, uh, 
when we speak about closed condition or uh, let's say quarantine condition, we can at least the, the stage of growing the GM plants, we can do it very easily and uh, straightforwardly. So this is a very uh, big advantage in Israel and also a very big advantage uh, on our platform because we're using uh, leafy plants which are uh, fit for indoor and vertical farming but, uh, and also greenhouse and outdoor uh, methods. So it's a very big advantage in terms of time to market. Let's uh, let's make this uh, maybe a topic here that we that everybody can share their opinions on is um, the the regulatory part. We heard from about South Africa that this is a very open market in, in terms of regulation and open to GM, so it seems to be easier to start something there. But then again, of course, um, you don't want to be limited to one one country. Probably the US is more tempting there. Then Mulek, you are. Um, working in different or in a couple of countries, um, you can maybe share also if you don't have a, in, an EU company, actually, it would be interesting because I think in the EU, it's probably like in many cases, the, the last region, the last um, geography where you will see some innovation being approved for the market, unfortunately, or fortunately, some people have different opinions on that. Anyways, let's talk about South Africa, then um, Argentina and UK and US from Mulek and also from Mexico. I guess you have the US, of course, um, on your on your mind. Um, in the end, uh, Thomas, please. Sure thing. Um, so from our side, we're actually we have a, a US headquarters um, with a South African subsidiary. So we've mainly chosen chosen South Africa because we know the regulators here, um, and it's a relatively big market. Um, in terms of the regulatory aspects itself, um, it's very similar to the US. Um, there's been a little bit of a, um, I want to say, less approval of GM crops in the last uh, five years or so, but it's now picking up again. Um, and I think it's mainly because, you know, we've got a, a, great, a growing population to feed. Um, and yeah, the, the, the aspect of GM foods is not something that is a taboo topic um especially among most consumers yeah uh, another interesting trend is actually the approval of gm crops throughout the rest of africa there's a growing trend towards acceptance of gm crops where there was a lot of resistance previously and um, i think there's a bigger push from governments um, certain agencies are trying to get um, gm approved crops into africa i know the gates foundation is doing a lot with soybean throughout Africa and doing trials. So hopefully that's a trend that continues and spreads throughout Africa because Africa def definitely needs GM crops um, with climate change and drought resistance traits and things like that. Thanks a lot for those insights. So what about Argentina and the rest of the world from Mulek's perspective when it comes to regulation and- um, yeah, Sure. Sure, well, we, we stick to to the U.S. and, and Argentina from a, for, a, for the cultivation side of the operations. We understand understand well well uh, both um, territories and frameworks. Um, lucky to say that um, we is running the, um, the the regulatory team in in. In Mulek is uh, David Herum. Uh, he was um, a US, USDA regulator for more than 30 years. Um, so um, so he, he knows quite well the, the US framework, not only for US AFIS, also for the FDA. As Laura uh, Margarita Lopez said, you know, uh, most of the other con uh, countries um, see or replicate what uh, happened in the US. So we could assume uh, that if we approve uh, some products from the FDA food perspective uh, and from the USDA AFIS, uh, that could uh, be replicated in different other territories as well. From the Argentina yes. side, we know it quite well because because a BioCeres team and, and, and our great partner, I didn't mention that BioCeres is one of our major holders as an institutional investor and 
a great partner for us. Um, and of course, uh, the regulatory side of the story uh, is, is very relevant for us. And, um, and, and, and we, we have access to their team and, 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 and we co-work in some way. Um, so we also have the, the experience from this from the Kymosin project uh, and product. We we uh, achieve uh, their regulation uh, in Argentina for for, for safflower seeds, and that's uh, quite groundbreaking in, in, in biotech. You know, by by getting uh, these trade approved, uh, have to, I mean the regu their regulation uh, in in Argentina, but. We all know that uh, that we are all following existing frameworks. Uh, we we are not creating a new framework uh, compared to molecular farming with um, culture meat, for example. That um, they said uh, uh, sort of like a new framework. Um, since this com since this technology uh, came from. Um, vaccines and pharmaceutical industry. We all know that we could or not could follow uh, some some pathways. Uh, internally in Mulek, we are in, in conversations with the regulators in the United States and Argentina um, as we speak uh, in totally different fronts. Um, really looking forward to um, Co -work, to co-working with the other molecular farming companies to exchange experience in that regard. I think that what uh, precision fermentation made uh, or, or have announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, we get sort of like a consortium of nine different companies. It's very, very uh, interesting uh, in terms of the, um, the things that are in common each of us, uh, regulation is one of them. So really looking forward to continuing talking with, with all of you on how we could help us uh, to go faster. We all have our secret ingredients, our IP, our investors uh, and our standalone teams, but we could see each other's competitors or as partners. And in terms of regulation, I think that uh, we all have the same goal. Huh? We need to get our products uh, to be approved because we need to hit the market uh, to solve major problems uh, in the food system. So let's go faster and coordinate it. And that, that's at least my, my way of thinking. Yeah, now we were talking about the re regulational aspect. Um, as you correctly said, Casson, you're, the, 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 the topic itself or the technology comes from the pharmaceutical industry. How difficult is it for all of you to make more um, clarification, to have a better uh, awareness in the food sector? Now talking to big business uh, parties, multinationals, ingredient providers, etc., and and also to give them an idea what this new technology or also established technology in an, in another industry um, could really do for the food sector. Maybe you can give us uh, some idea um, um, what your experiences were talking to uh, other business partners and what your entrance would always be. Is it the uh, cost efficiency? Is it the scalability? Is it the alternative technology to, to other um, uh, topics like uh, we already said? Um, yeah, share, share a bit more your view on, on that. That would be the, the commercial aspect uh, as such, yeah. Well, um, yeah, just, I don't know if it is yeah, Maggie, because Maggie she me, or, so she seems to have a lot on, yeah. on your mind. I first, and then Maggie, please. Okay, sure. Very quick. Uh, in my experience, the um, the pandemic and the Ukraine Russia war accelerate the conversations with established players. Uh, the pandemic, because we the, the population is quite more. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, close to science now, uh, to, to, to embracing science uh, to, to overcome the, uh, let's say, the, the big problems that we have on the planet. And, and the Ukraine-Russia war, unfortunately, 
because of food security. So the, what, what is happening is that the, the food producers uh, need to focus on cost and functionality. And what the consumer are pushing is nutrition as well, you know? So in these three main pillars, I personally believe we, Mule as a whole, personally believe that molecular farming has a nutritious approach, an, af an affordable approach, slash scalable approach, uh, and uh, a functional approach focusing on organoleptic properties and other functions that the industry needs. At the end of the day, food producers, ingredient companies, CPG companies, needs better ingredients to produce better products and improve the whole economics of these products as well. Mm -hmm. And they are starting seeing molecular farming as one of the potential solutions for these frame main pillars. But maybe, and this is something that I really want to put on the table here, that we need to start combining our own solutions with other technologies as well. Mm -hmm. I came from a traditional industry. I know how to produce a traditional sausage, traditional burger, an animal-based burger. And this is not a one technology product. You know? There are more than 10 different technologies to produce an animal-based product, processing product. You know? and, and, if that could and, and we could do the same in alternative by combining molecular farming, some fermentation, some culture meat in the future, and over, over a plant-based cost structure. I will, I will open the discussion there maybe for, 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 for another question and then leave the floor here to Lauren. Maggie, please. Thank you. Well, actually we have an advantage as company Veloz Bio. We work uh, using uh, an transient expression uh, approach and in the regulatory frame sheet uh, here in Mexico, we don't have a ban for GM crops, but we have a hard regulations in terms of uh, env um, environmental safety because uh, here in Mexico we are the uh, the center of origin uh, for maize, for example, and we need to be very careful on where we establish the GM crops. But we have an advantage because actually transient expression, since we do not use um, a GM crop. It's not considered actually such as a GM technology. And mm, the molecule, the regulatory frame sheet here in Mexico in that way in, in, in thinking about labeling of the food products is, are not considered as GM products, uh, but bioengineer products very similar to US regulation. And that uh, has a, uh, give uh, to us an advantage on how to go to the market because by engineer products are part of, a, of a, our everyday life, for example, such as oils or for giving just a, an example about this. And that is a very, very amazing because the market is getting open to alternative products as by engineer products. And, and it's very nice because that gives us a, a very, very large space to make innovations in that way especially in this, in this way with alternative pro, uh, proteins and going actually with uh, food developers, food distributors and trying to, to make a special ingredients based on bioengineered uh, products. And that's very, very, very nice. It, it is a, actually a very, a very nice window to, to the development of uh, uh, alternative proteins and bioengineered products in that way. Thank you indeed. This makes it's a bit of a different different approach that makes this part, as it seems, easier. And then again, of course, there are technological and other challenges. We can talk about the the scalability or the the efficiency of of these different processes. I think this would cover alone uh, a whole a whole session, right? Fabio, yeah. because this is always the question: uh, How far away are you from the market? And you would answer this question, but I guess um, in, in different uh, ways. But then again, I would say there are still, apart from regulation, quite a, a few hurdles. So we're all talking about, of course, sustainability and about about a different approach to producing the food. If if everybody could share their view why this is one of the ways 
where people should invest and where we should, uh, you know, make the effort to to make this a reality, to to actually make this feasible. Maybe then you, Maggie, can start, and then we can go to Tal and um, Spire Foods, and then again to Gaston. Okay. Well, thinking about scalability, we're working on a, on on brains model, on pulses model. The model for uh, for making the expression of the protein this is very scalable. But I think uh, the main challenge we have maybe all of us of thinking on food ingredient companies when we want to develop a um, purified products on, or products that needs to meet some functionality is that we need to meet the standards of field regulations. So our downstream processing uh, would be aligned on that way. We need to use a, a food grade uh, process, food grade ingredients to meeting all the regulations in that way on, on food safety uh, and and so on. And that I think for us has been the, the main challenge that when you go to the literature and, and, and try to to read how to purify proteins, they use uh, sometimes uh, the hazard or solvents and so on. And you need to think in how to make uh, sustainable, affordable and uh, food friendly uh, processing. That, that for us uh, has been the, the main challenge over there. And then when, when we achieve this and, and we get the functional product, uh, it's a uh, music for the ears of uh, uh, our collaborators, clients, and for food distributors because that is the main challenge: how to reach a price parity with, for example, their products, and how to to achieve the quality of uh, an animal product. That's the, I think for us uh, has been the the two main challenges in that way. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tal. Your view on this? Uh, so. If the question was about challenges or why molecular farming uh, is. Well, I mean, this is really like the question. You know, we have precision fermentation, we have uh, cellular agriculture, and and uh, of course plant-based solutions and fermentation. Here's the question: How can this be feasible, and how can this be executed in a way that adds real value and makes offers a new and so, more sustainable way? Yeah. So both. Uh, cell culture and precision fermentation is methods or approaches that exist for 30 years at least, but they are exist mainly for production of very high value compounds for whole different industry, which is mainly life science and pharma pharmaceutical industry. There, the cost of product, we can use very high cost methods to produce very high value compounds. But when you come, uh, uh, when you try to assess or to, when you try to produce food commodities, and this is what we are trying to do, we cannot use high cost of production and uh, yes, high cost of production methods using plants as a biomanufacturer is significantly lower costs, uh, specifically when you, when you get very high yields of your desired compounds. And it's secondly, it's super scalability. So sc super scalable. So we only need for us, for example, we only need to grow more lettuce. It's the scale of uh, we're using uh, seeds production, and we can scale from one dunam to 100 hectare in no time. While using uh, cell culture and precision fermentation will take you $200 million for uh, establishment of only one facility, for example. The third, uh, mainly, maybe one of the best advantage of plants is when you try to mimic or to produce functional proteins that originate from animal, plants in many terms have the same post-translation modifications. Sorry if I'm cursing with too much biology, but I, I, I would try to do it as clear as possible. So the, the protein fold, which is crucial for the functionality of the proteins in pl uh, plant systems helps us 
to produce the correct folding while using microorganisms in many terms uh, will be much uh, harder in this way. I hope you heard me. Thanks, thanks a lot. I know I, we, we want to have a mix, a right balance here of science or of, of, um, of the technology here, and also, of course, of a general understanding so everyone can can benefit from it. Um, yeah, then on to Thomas and, and Inge. I know it's a very general question, like, I want to ask, like, is this scalable? It's so obvious that this is the question. It's more like, why this? And why now? And why are you optimistic that this will make the difference? This is rather the way I want to put yeah. this. I want to. I want to put this question. Uh, and maybe, uh, maybe Th Thomas, you can also answer in this combination also the question that you are already answering in the Q and A section. So then, then we have it all. <laughs> sure, you speak, you're speaking about the the three commercially grown GMOs. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Natalie, for that question. Um, there's a IS AAA website that you can go check out um, that has all the GM approved. Um, crops for each country around the world. Um, South Africa also has canola and uh, rice. rice in addition to the cotton, maize, and soy as GM approved crops currently being grown. Um, and then uh, I guess coming back to the, the question at hand, uh, which is the commercialization aspect, I think molecular farming, obviously there's, there's the obvious advantages of um, scalability and the existing infrastructure being able to leverage that. Um, it's there's also various ways of doing molecular farming, right? So whether you grow indoors or in the field, um, depending on what crop you use, um, that also makes a difference. Are there some additional or existing revenue streams for that? Uh, and then there's also a plant protein compatibility aspect. So, and this is something that I think scientists have been scratching their heads on for a long time, which is which some plants are just more suitable to produce others. And it has to do with the internal machinery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the reason why we're so excited about this is because we can see a trend around the world, mostly that people are starting to look for sustainable solutions. We see the cost benefit and the functionality benefit as um, both of the previous speakers have spoke, spoken about. Um, and from our perspective as well, uh, there's, we, the way we try to think about this is we think with the end in mind. So when you think about what do you want this to look like, we have to take into account the end consumer. We have to take into account the food processor. We have to take into account the farmer. Um, and obviously then we have to take into account our own team and our capabilities. And we definitely think that there's a, a good match of technologies that we've put together that allows us to address all of those different aspects. And the world is now in a situation where we can make those changes. The technology is there. Um, and I think it's really now more about execution than anything else. Maybe a little bit. Very, very beautiful uh, uh, summary here. Um, thank you very much. The topic of food security is of course also one of the most, uh, uh, the biggest challenges that we are meeting nowadays. And the question here is also, on the one hand, genetic modified crops are used you know, to be a bit more resistant uh, in terms of the big climate change. But on the other hand, of course, we are talking, as you correctly said, uh, about uh, um, other needs in, in the market. We need to have an, uh, a more diverse alternative protein landscape. We need to have uh, uh, technologies that are helping us to, to really um, solve this uh, big change. So when we talk about the development cycles here and a bit also about the R&D perspective, can you give us an idea um, how long it would take to, for example, find a solution to improve it, et cetera, and, and, and about what kind of cycles are we talking here? Just to, to give an idea, and um, this also goes after you to, to the others, so that we get a mid, bit more uh, a picture um, how solutions can be evolved uh, um, and, and, and go to the mass market and, and, and further develop. I think this is something that helps us all to get a better um, and greater picture of, 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 of the solution as, as such. Sure thing. Um, I think the Inga has a good saying um, she, when we just think about molecular farming versus precision fermentation to start with. Precision fermentation is short-term simplicity, long-term complexity because of the scaling. And then molecular farming is the opposite. It's short-term complexity, but long-term simplicity. Because once you've got the plant, you can go wherever you want to go, basically. 
within regulations, of course. Um, the in terms of the the question at hand, um, I think that there's a couple of different ways to think about this. And it's important that we maybe highlight the two different types of expression, and Maggie alluded to this earlier. There's transient expression, which is you take a non-GM crop and you infect it with a, um, a basically a, a non-harmful bacteria that contains your gene of interest, and it produces the protein within a week. But then the plant dies, and then you have to do it again. So the iteration cycle there is quite quickly. You can probably get some valuable results within a couple of months. Um, you can start scaling that. Uh, you can start actually, I think, getting to market within you know two, two to three years, I would say is a, a good estimate. Um, and then on the other hand, you've got the transgenic, which is where the gene that encodes for the protein you want to express integrates into the genome of the plant. And every subsequent generation of the plant contains that gene. Now, for that, it takes a little bit longer because you have to transform it, grow it to full size, and then make sure that that gene is stable over multiple generations. So in that sense, and this is where we're talking about GM field crops specifically, you've got a go-to-market timeline of anywhere from seven to maybe nine years, depending on some of the regulatory aspects around it. So it is a much longer process to follow that route. But there's also sort of an intermediate where you can take those transgenic crops that have the permanent gene in it and you can grow it in an indoor environment, which shortens your timeline because you don't need regulatory approval if you're not going to grow it out in the field. So I think depending on what your long-term goal is, the scale at which you want to operate and what the regulatory restrictions are that you're facing and what your technology is, you're looking at a time span of commercialization anywhere from two to three years all the way to 10 years. Wow. Okay. That helps answer the question. Anyone wants to challenge that or just agree? Okay. Uh, maybe maybe I, I, I can add up just a little bit. Uh, I agree with most uh, said, but uh, only one comment, maybe uh, transient expression is not highly scalable as we think, as we need it to be in the food industry. So, in in transient expression, you would have to grow the, for example, the agrobacteria or even the viruses. There is transient transient expression using viruses. Okay, so I think this is for Maggie. I'm sure we have some. We definitely need to grow it. So you have enough. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but but yeah. just a second. I, I would. I, I, yeah. I'm sorry about that. It's not. But another thing that I want to, to comment is it's it's depending also on the crop that you're using not only not only by where you can grow it uh, indoor outdoor greenhouse etc but also uh, the life cycle of the of the crop so if the life cycle of, of your crop is 3 months is one thing and if the the life cycle of your crop is 3 weeks it's another it's a totally different thing and you can get also, the breeding procedures will be much, much uh, faster. Yeah, maybe there's. A, this is a general question. I'm sure it comes up a lot as well. Someone asked Maximilian, asked it here in the Q and A section, which is the most, you know, the most useful or the, the the most efficient plant to use. I'm sure there's not one not one answer to that, but maybe you can give us a you know some idea of what we're talking about. And then Maggie, I'm sure you want to say something about uh, transient, exp transient expression here. Yeah, actually, because uh, transient expression depends uh, on the model. I, I think I'm going to sound uh, as a biologist that depending on the species <laughs> uh, works the system, but also in the in the development moment, you make this uh, this expression. For us, that's our secret. Uh, our company is called Veloz Bio, that is in Spanish, uh, fast. And one of the advantages of um, of uh, transient expression, as Inge, Inge said, is that the, the delivery times of the protein are very fast. And you need to know a, lo a lot about the biology of the, of the plant systems 
and to, to make uh, this approach, and that's our secret, how to make uh, a fast, scalable, and sustainable approach of that. That is our R&D secret, and I think uh, all, all of us have our R&D secrets to make uh, our our platforms scalable and, uh, and able to, to get to the market. And I think all the technologies has uh, her their own uh, pros and cons. But actually, if we, we if 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 we get the correct approach, all of them are amazing technologies, and all of us can we uh, achieve uh, good products that go to the market. I think uh, that is one of the, the the most beautiful things about molecular farming. That is not only thinking on GMO evil crops. That 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 was uh, the perception that uh, people had 20, 30 years ago. Actually, you have a lot of alternatives. Actually, you have many technologies uh, uh, derived from this uh, of, from this platform. Let's think uh, on molecular farming as a platform, such as precision fermentation. We don't think just in one bacteria or one system. We have many, many uh, alternatives to to express uh, and deliver a functional protein that goes to the market. I just want to to add that to, to the discussion. Mm -hmm. What about the velocity? Because this is what you're emphasizing at Velospy, of course, that you're using um, a different approach here. Can would you would you say that your life cycle and then also your uh, your your time to market is, is 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 shorter or faster compared to the others because of your your approach? Uh, actually, we're a very young company. We started last year. Uh, we are uh, we started working with the R and D. Um, side one year ago we expressed our first first protein uh, at the four months of age let's say it like that we developed the the platform in four months and then uh, in september october we started talking uh, with potential customers and collaborators and now we are trying to position two or three products in the market that's the velocity of uh, transient expression and this is one of the advantages that we can we can move fast and actually, for for some products, is uh, suitable just to 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 see if the protein is going to work the way we want. But in that way, we we learn how to to make these tests scalable, just for go to a commercial scale. That's the thing uh, that makes this technology amazing. Gaston, do you want to add to that? So that is that part of the discussion. I I love seeing. Uh... Uh, molecular farming, um, the whole technology combining transient expression with stable transformation, uh, seeing leaves, seeds, different hosts, different different hosts, different crops, uh, food crops, non-food crops. I think that we mm -hmm. haven't reached what plants can do, and that's absolutely great. I'm really happy to see plenty of different molecular farming companies with different approaches. And that's I think is quite great for for the for the movement for the molecular farming movement. Um, I personally think uh, I, I fully agree with Thomas uh, what he described about the cycles and the differences between more with the precision fermentation, um, and also with Tal. Of course, I agree with Laura, and I, I am happy that that see Velos Bio going fast. And prototyping and getting some samples quite fast is absolutely amazing. Um, but I really want to emphasize the um, and the the the, the capex the capex uh, part of the business, you know, and the infrastructure um, because uh, the food industry need uh, tons in a, uh, in a in a proper cost. And what I personally believe is that plants take time, the science take time, the regulatory pathway take time. Yeah. But at the end of the road, when you get the new generation of seeds, the biology could do the rest and the current infrastructure do the rest. We don't need to build, we need to create land to grow if you have a commercial host or such as soy. 98% of the soy in the United States is GM. 92% of the soy in the whole world is GM. Uh, just take soy, you know, so, as an example. You know? um, 
and uh, most of the ingredient big players has their position in soil too. Uh, their, 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 their facilities to recover soy proteins. Most of them are used to, to, to GM seeds because their main industry is feed and not food. Yeah. So the question here is, could we see molecular farming as the, as the technology that could be the hacker of the feed to food conversion thing? Actually, if we could define the feed to food conversion system as totally inefficient, if you see it in, as, as, as a sustainable point of view, of course, because of the land use, because of the water use, because the CO2 emissions. And at the end of the day, what molecular farming is doing is getting a shortcut than going directly into food. 50% of the problems in the world goes to feed. And the part and the, the, the bad part of the whole value chain is the one that I really that I'm really proud because of my family business, but we need to be uh, conscious that this is the, 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 the worst part of the, of the whole movie, that is the, to feed animals, to raise animals, to kill animals, to get animal proteins. So what we are, or at least from, from Mulek's perspective, um, um, giving uh, now uh, to the, as, as an option to the market is to get a shortcut here because the beauty of our technology and at least again from Mulek's approach from, from our approach and Mulek's approach is to is to modify just only a seed mm -hmm. and then the biology do the rest and the current infrastructure do the rest it could be quite absolutely great to to stick to the commodity cost structure. Yes, and I think that we are all aiming to, to, to get that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's, it's really amazing the timing. Uh, and, 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 and I'm really looking forward to seeing progress in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in all of the different molecular farming companies around the globe. Um, there was a thank you very much, Gaston. There is a question from Matis uh, Holcher. He's asking, are you all looking for B2B uh, solutions or is someone of you looking also into a B2C solution? So we heard that you're working on parts uh, for for different. I mean, it's always an option to create also a sub brand uh, where you can try a bit where you can get customer reaction and, and stuff like this. So um, maybe you can, uh, you can, yeah. W w what is your perspective on this? Is it just the, the pure B2B angle or would you also consider to create a first brand also to create custom awareness to, um, see how you can position the whole topic, um, in, in the market in a better way. That's not ultra processed or that it has, um, this recognition as it has with GMO food uh, at the moment. Well, since, since we were, we're talking, uh, I could expand an, an answer. Uh, Bullock is B2B. I uh, personally believe that we need to focus on ingredients because we will never teach how to position brands and, and formulate end products uh, with the, uh, to, to the big players. You know, I think that, that um, what the, the necessity is in ingredients, not in good products. People know how to produce good products. People know, people know. Uh, the Nestle of the world knows how to position, communicate, um, and develop and, and produce good food products. What they don't uh, have are ingredients 2.0, you know? So we need to, we need to, personally focus on ingredients and co-work with established players. And on the other side, we need to be conscious of the market. I'm talking about the financial market now. Mm -hmm. I think that we are not anymore in 2020 or 2021. So there is a market financial constraint and to position a market, a, a, a brand, to, to develop a B2C uh, approach is really expensive. So we need to decide where to allocate the investment 
And I think it could be is it is quite more clever to take what plant based have been uh, made uh, for the for the last years, positioning alternative products into the shelf, uh, and, and, and and focus now in, in in helping them and all the food producers to get better products and and, and upgrade their their products uh, uh, to find a consumer. About the, about the others, <laughs> do you see it the same way? Uh, I'm totally agree with the stone. Also with the last thing that uh, he said, the pigment form. Uh, however, we are, first we, we have strategic partners uh, from the, the, the very big uh, food manufacturers, both uh, from Israel and global. And we are experiencing, uh, let's say, pure food tech or a final product designing using our uh, ingredients, uh, only for, for, for uh, accelerate the go to market with our partners. Thomas yeah. Inge? Um, yeah, from our side, uh, we're definitely in the long term, we see the highest value in terms of being a B2B supplier. Um, but we also see the value in the short term of developing your own brand, developing your own product. Um, it's useful for one to see your, your protein function in a product. Um, so you can actually go and show that to a potential business partner in the future. But at the same time, it generates some awareness. It allows you to educate the market um, and for us having a, obviously our target market is the US. It is one of the biggest and most, uh, let's call it lucrative markets in this space. Um, but we also have access to the South African market, which is not small and there's not that much competition. So there's a lot of opportunity to explore here. So people are hungry for alternatives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we also We're, see value in in testing out our protein as a product so that it can also inform the r d arm so kind of working at it from both sides of the equation yeah in terms of her say Ingers mentioned that uh, we're hungry for alternatives we import so much beyond meat it's not even funny the restaurants run out of it by four days into the week <laughs> Good news for Beyond Meat. I mean, <laughs> they, need to, they need support as well, um, as we all know. No, but uh, seriously, then um, going to Mexico, maybe seeing your perspective or hearing your perspective as well, um, Maggie. Yeah, actually, for us, in that way, going to the market for us uh, with our model, we think every single seed that, that was an, an one advantage of working with the uh, with pulses and seeds. We see each single seeds as a complete bio refinery and we actually go to the b2b market and we 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 don't use we we try to to use all the compounds of the of the seed not only the pro the the recommended proteins but also the, the proteins the starches fibers everything in in our idea is going to to the market to through a b2b approach and going to to the ingredient suppliers just to making a special ingredients that could be um, applied in, in certain industries at the moment we're focused on on beverages and cheese uh, industries and this is the idea of how we go how going to the market and and we have this advantage that uh when we demonstrate that we don't have a, a genetic material in our products, we are considered as a bioengineer products and the, the labeling in that way for us in Mexico and the US is very friendly, very, very friendly in that way. Thanks. Um, since um, the topic of investment came up, we all know that you are raising or you have raised successfully at different stages, different different ways and different um, amounts given your, your backgrounds and and uh, stage um, but someone was asking from the audience how investors are responding to your to your offering to your solution compared to precision fermentation but i think overall and given the current circumstances yeah. Carl, you want to start <laughs> yeah. you uh, successfully. Yeah. how was that and what is your perspective on uh, uh, so 
I see much more acceptance uh, as, as we move on or as we, yeah, with the process. Uh, people are under, uh, starting to understand the benefits of using plants uh, and the, the drawbacks of, of uh, let's say, alternative methods in the, in the food tech industry or in the food tech arena. Uh, I, I do see differences between Europeans and the America, Americans, uh, for example, uh, VCs. So uh, the US uh, have much more acceptance to, to our offerings, uh, especially when, when you speak about big corporates, for example, uh, like the European, like DSM or, or ingredient companies, you name it, Givaudan, et cetera, the big ones, they do, they, they very much interesting interested about the solutions but i believe that uh, that that the population are less and this is where they uh, the, this is where the customers are so they have some problems not only from regulation aspect but also from uh, uh, from what uh, people think about about the, the the offering and in the us it's totally different uh, yeah, still, when when you got when when you can supply something like uh, that missing, so also the the Europeans are interested. Like for for example, in in the vanillin case, they love it, uh, but but they they would try to avoid it uh, in many ways. So I do see some differences, but I I see also. Uh, much higher acceptance uh, than fr from the beginning when we only when when we uh, raised our first uh, round our pre seed round it was much harder then. And the others, if you want to share your two cents or your many cents on on fundraising on the investment climate, rather. Well, I'm I'm not private anymore. So, but, but, but for you, Gaston. Could, so it's a, <laughs> it's a totally it's a totally different uh, it's a totally different uh, thing. The the financial part of the of the story for Mulek now. But what what I could add on top of what what Tal said is that uh, the role of the funds are to diversify their investments. You know, so what I personally started seeing. Uh, the, the, the couple of years ago is that the funds started to invest in molecular farming because they need to invest in different technologies to de-risk their portfolios of portfolios of investments. Uh, so I think that this started as a de-risking thing, and now the funds are understanding the position of molecular farming, uh, and, and I, I think that the. Uh, uh, the investment will grow on, um, on, on, on this direction. And, and that's my, my personal opinion. And also the, I, the, the corporates uh, are also understanding the, the potential of plants. Um, there, there is a, um, a, a good opportunity also for, for them to take position of, of molecular farming companies from the very beginning in early stages. Uh, co-working from uh, directly, uh, so really looking forward to, to seeing uh, uh, more, more, more investments in Ivana Croft. First buyer and Belos buyer, I know you are raising or you have raised some money already, of course. Um, how do you see it compared to what you've, yeah, you know, through throughout the last year, everything got more complicated, more difficult. How do you see it now as an advantage that you have this rather exciting and new approach, as Gaston said, and as Tal also said, there is more openness maybe because of the diversification and the hope that this can be actually delivering what others have not yet delivered. Yeah, actually that's very interesting because what that was one of our concerns in the beginning because this is a very new technology and some people is scared about the, this kind of, uh, of uh, wave of molecular farming and the uh, GMO approaches. And, and that was our concern, but we are very surprised to see that uh, considering 
uh, this uh, new sustainable approach and uh, the idea of, uh, of using the biorefineries and giving this kind of ingredients uh, have been very well received by investors and, 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 and the public in general. And actually, we are uh, in the process of fundraising just uh, for, for uh, by building our, our scale plant. So we are open to, to investments. And actually, it has, has been very, very, very nice. We have obtained very good response, and we are in that way uh, working on this stage. And, and, and we are very, very happy to see that the investors and companies and, and many initiatives to, to give the welcome to alternative proteins to plant-based solutions and to be open to new technologies. For us, has been a very, very nice surprise in that way. Perfect. Thank you very much, Maggie. Um, Thomas, you want to add something? Or... Sure, just briefly, I, I think uh, generally over the last six months, the investors have been a little bit more, you know, hesitant, they want to see a lot more data, they want to see proof points, they want to, in essence, I think it's a, a function of the global macroeconomic environment, but also a function of, you know, maybe some previous investments in alternative types of technologies haven't reached the price points that they were looking for. And so there is a, a lot more diligence being done around that front. Um, I think from our perspective, we're basically about to close some fundraising as well. Um, from our perspective, the, there's also a difference in how they perceive this in terms of the time length, but it's a positive one. They see a lot of potential in the technology, um, but there's also this combined with the macro environment, like this need for more diligence, which I think is a healthy thing for the sector in general. I think I think you expressed it very well with the topic that uh, you see in some technologies the in the long run the complexity, and this is uh, this is what what uh, has been what, what was visible last year, last year, and uh, and so I think um, this is the reason why many people are well, many investors and, and business partners are, are asking more questions because. Yeah, when it comes to scalability, is there enough room space, etc.? What are the big challenges if you really go for the long run? Um, I see that also the chat is used by all our participants to introduce themselves. So please use it uh, if if you haven't used it uh, at all. Um, <clears throat> my last question, or well, one of the last questions we want to ask uh, our panelists today is: so. We have some investors here in, in our audience. We have some business partners here. Maybe every one of you can say what he's at the moment looking for and where he needs support and what kind of business partners you would to uh, or, or you, you need at the moment or what kind of connections so that people can reach out afterwards to you that uh, I think could be, could be a very helpful uh, thing for you. So please go for it. Who wants to start? Come on. We're happy to go. Um, ladies, fir ladies first. <laughs> especially, especially today. Okay. In our case, uh, the kind of... Actually, we are working on a collaborative model because our idea is to develop the ingredients just for, for food partners and their applications. And the idea is just developing the ingredients uh, hand by hand with the with our customers the idea is to develop solutions and this is one of the the very nice thing about proteins they are plastic molecules and and depending on the conditions we can give certain functionalities that can that may work for certain applications and this is one of the of the good things in, in this kind of models actually we're working on collaborative models uh where we provide the the, the development of the ingredient and the samples and our partner uh, uh, provides the, their knowledge in food industry and, the, and the, the, the technical knowledge about the ingredient application or, or the ingredient usage or the specific properties they need to be a, a, a product suitable to go to the market. Okay. Yes. And Aspire Foods? I guess we'll go next. Um, I suggested that Inga speak, but she said she doesn't really want to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
given what Gaston just mentioned. Um, from our side, I think there's there's really two areas that we're interested in, in, in uh, I, I guess, leveraging some external expertise. Um, the first is bioprocessing. Um, there's obviously, uh, in a lot of the ways that we're thinking, there's a lot of work to be thought through and done there. Um, and then the second is on the regulatory front. Um, just a, a, a much deeper understanding. We, we think we've got a good grip on it. Um, but, you know, from a legal perspective, I think there's always um, more aspects to, to think about. And I, I think, generally speaking, we also need a bit of a change, uh, advocacy for a change in regulatory um, frameworks, yeah. both in South Africa, in the US, and in Europe, I, I guess. I don't want to point too many fingers, but yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think in particular as well, you know, a, lo a lot of the concerns that there are around um, GMs have to do with unwanted gene flow and a lot of the technologies, you know, like um, the gene restriction, gene use restriction technologies um, have a bit of a bad reputation because they're seen um, by the public as seed companies just wanting to protect their patents and not letting farmers collect seeds for the next season. But these are technologies that could also really help to prevent um, unwanted gene flow to the environment and could really advance GM technologies across the board. So it would be good to have a bit of advocacy and maybe um, enhance scientific understanding around these technologies as well, because they're not the boogeymen that people think they are. Thanks. That's really, really insightful and helpful also to, you know, to postulate something that, that, uh, that startups and companies want to see more of and, and facilitate. Gaston? Sure, thank you. Uh, well, I really want to take uh, what uh, Inge have just said uh, about uh, GM. I sent in the chat uh, a link uh, as a website uh, of one of our initiatives um, on that regard. Uh, it's gmforgood.org. I, uh, we personally believe uh, in Mulek that we need to embrace science in food and this, and there is a lot of discussion um, around, uh, about this topic, but, uh, but there is a lot of uh, misinformation. Um, we need to raise a voice about GM in food, uh, I think all together in a way, and this could be a way uh, to, to, to found a, a movement um, that, that could communicate, educate, um, and inform uh, the benefits of the GM techniques when you use it properly, safely, and in a sustainable way. Not because we are saying it, because regulators could say it, and, and because the scientific community is behind. I think there is a huge gap between consumers. Uh, the non-GM thing of the, of, the, of the discussion and the, the real thing that is happening internally in our companies and, and other companies as well. Mm -hmm. And here I'm not talking only about molecular part. We all know the challenge that precision fermentation has to get non-GM products. And that it could be quite worse for precision fermentation to purify uh, the, the final molecule uh, to get in non-GM. What for? If a yeast, a fungi, even if a, a bacteria could be food grade and food approved. We need to focus on affordability and sustainable sustainability. And, and a way to do that is, is or at least we can't find a, a better way that this uh, without, without taking uh, science and put it uh, on top of everything, you know? And, and that's what we are doing every day. So um, again, you know, I, I, I think the GM thing uh, should be something that could uh, join us uh, uh, in, a, in a message. GM for good could be a vehicle for that. I really encourage you all to at least 
check out the, the website and, 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 and send messages and emails and, and try to build this sort of like community and movement um, to, to, to have a clear and, and a clear message, you know. Um, that will be one thing. Uh, and, the, and finally, on the, on the business side of the, the story, I think that, that we haven't talked uh, about the big ingredients, plants, grains, companies, you know? And I think that when the, the Bangis, the Dreyfus, the Cargills, the ADM, uh, the ingredients, the, the, the big ingredient players starts taking uh, these uh, future products uh, into their own operations, it could be a game changer. Because we could always do the whole thing. We need capex. We need a lot of investment. We need knowledge to do the whole thing. Uh, the, the molecular biology, the, the multiplication of seeds, the regulatory approvals, the downstream process, talking about tons, not grain. Huh? This is, will be the challenge, huh? tons, because to feed the world, we need tons. To heat the masses, we need tons. If not, we are going to end uh, as a cool niche. Huh? No, we are here to solve big problems. And, and there are big companies here solving great problems, but uh, I'm not personally seeing innovation there. We could be the innovation part of this story. And I'm really looking forward to, to seeing these, these big players uh, embracing science, embracing uh, the startups. There are some initiatives, that's absolutely great, uh, but we are all, always talking about the Tysons or the food producers and the, uh, or the beyond meat play products or, or, or sorry, companies. And I think there is a very, very important part of the value chain in the middle that could do the, the, the game changing thing uh, in, in, the, in, in our industry. So I don't know, it's, this would be the, the two messages here, you know, GM, okay, let's work together to get a clear message for the whole industry, not only for the final consumer, for the whole industry. And secondly, okay, so let's, let's try to, to see these big, big folks as, as a good potential partners in the future. Mm -hmm. Gaston, there seems to be an issue with the website, at least from Germany. We can't access it, the GM for good, but I'm, I'm sure it's a, it's a, it's a oh. platform and everyone should, should we are. Okay. afterwards. Anyways, maybe Tal, you want to add to, to that, um, to, the, to the messages that we heard now? Yeah, uh, I just want to say that I fully agree again with Gaston and Thomas and Laura that speaks about the need of, uh, of using GM. I, I think it's... <laughs> We would have to do it. Humanity would have to do it. GM using super powerful tool for feeding the crazily growing population. And it would be probably, uh, considering the climate change, uh, it would be probably impossible to do it without it. Um, <clears throat> Again, I see much more acceptance also in the big uh, ingredients producers and food manufacturers. So I'm optimistic about it, about the future of uh, farming. Uh, everybody, also investors, strategic partners, and uh, everybody. Uh, op I, I believe also in collaboration between us guys. So uh, uh, it, it, every time we have this webinar, I also think we have to fix those internet prove issues. Prove itself <laughs> very powerful. Apart from the very sorry for that. that we're, we're having here in terms of food and uh, sustainability and animal welfare, but yes, that's also an issue. <laughs> we also find found the uh, I don't know the the right website for GM for good. I know there seems to be different different um, URLs out there, uh, so check those check this out. 
Anyways, I really love that our chat, and this is always like for, for our future food series, the case that we have lots of experts or people that are that are trying to connect with one another. And that's that's why this this chat is also very much live and people are using it as a site as a as a as a feed for, for all kinds of messages and connecting. So this is this is great. Mm -hmm. So everyone, thanks for for being so interactive here and for being so active and 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 connect and connecting with other people. Yeah, if there if there is a question afterwards, I guess you can contact our, our panelists or you can contact us, Albrecht from ProVeg Incubator, Fabio from Synthenus, and we are more than happy to connect uh, within the community afterwards. Yes, this um, we heard a couple of closing remarks already. I would say, mm -hmm. um, so this I think it makes sense to 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 call it. A webinar for for today. There's so many more things we want to cover. I think there would be a would be would deserve you know a, a series uh, of its own. Um, but let's see where where we will be going the next couple of months and next year and then this year with uh, with molecular farming and the companies present here, but also um, the other companies out there working on it and corporates collaborating with you because it's really important to see. How this is how this is growing and also the investment space, of course. So I'm very excited about it. I'm sure sure you are as well. And, and and so is Fabio. So we want to hear more about it next time. For now, thank you so much for being with us yeah. in this yeah, Thanks. anniversary edition, the 10th edition um, of the future food series. And um, we'll be in touch and yeah. talk to you very, very soon. Yeah. Thanks. And, uh, and I like the phrase uh, that from Aspire Food that molecular farming seems to be in a short term complex, but in the long term, simplicity wins. So thank you very much for this really great session. Or it was from you. <laughs> thank you very much Thanks. for this great session. And I hope to see all of you uh, at our next future food series. Best wishes from Berlin. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.